what are we going to be talking about this week? I'm glad you Basil asked. <laughs> I'm Claire. I'm Vince. And this is Friends, Friends of, of Legend. Legend. Welcome to Friends of Legend, where we take you where the wild things are, but without the nightmarish Hollywood rendition. You really have it out for that movie. It freaked me out badly. I'll have to take your word for it. (laughs) So this week, we are doing something a little bit different. If you're watching us right now, then you already know. But if you're listening to us on a podcast provider, then be aware there is a visual component this week. Yes. For your eyes and your ears this time. Yeah, so we're experimenting with YouTube video podcast um, just to see if it's more fun for y'all and for us, and we'll see how it goes. Please let us know what you think. Yeah, we we love feedback, and we desperately want to know how you feel. So um, write into us on our YouTube channel or on our website. Um, Directly at friendsoflegend at gmail.com. Yes. But the link to this video is going to be in the description of the podcast episode. So if you want, you can go right over right now. Yep, and, there it is. And look at our beautiful faces. So this week, we're talking about two different creatures who are not so dissimilar from each other. This is kind of like the Swan Maiden and Selkie episode, but a little bit different, a little... A little bit more mm, on the darker end, I want to well, say. Don't keep us in suspense. Okay. Well, this subject was sent in to us by a very, very good friend of ours and our dungeon master, Aaron. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Aaron. If you ever have a suggestion for an episode that you want us to do, then you can write into us the methods that we mentioned before or you can also reach out to us on our Facebook page our Twitter we're all over the place and we'll talk about those specifics a little later today we're going to be talking about the basilisk and the cockatrice Ooh, so I really honestly get them jumbled up in my head Um, at least you know the classic depiction of both well you're not alone so I know that when I imagined a basilisk before I did all this research, my only image was of Harry Potter in the Chamber of Secrets, that huge serpent. Which isn't really accurate, as right. far as I know. Yeah. So, well, what do you what do you know about them? So I know that they both have relationships with snakes, toads, and chickens. Mm-hmm. There are some combination of the two three yeah yeah you're not wrong so i'm just gonna go more into detail about that which one do you want to talk about first let's talk about the basilisk because i figure that's probably going to be a little more familiar okay sounds good so the basilisk well let me start with the name the name kind of more or less means serpent king it comes from the ancient greek word basilius Mm-hmm. Which means king. And then I know Lisk means serpent. Yeah. That's a, a very common uh, suffix for serpent. You're very good at linguistics. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I'm glad that you said that. Um, so then later on in history, the Greek word uh, basiliskos came into play. And iskos is a diminutive. So that means little king uh, or serpent. Oh, little so, king. <laughs> yeah. And it's called a king, most likely because it's got a miter on its head. It's got this little white patch that looks a bit like a crown, um, a little crest on its head. Is that what a miter is, a white patch? I've never heard that word before. Um, from what I could tell, it just is another word for a, a crown or a diadem. Oh. But, yeah, an old um, word. Yeah. Miter. <laughs> so, the one of the 
more confusing parts of the basilisk versus the cockatrice is the way that it's born. So the basilisk is an egg of a serpent or a toad that's been incubated by a chicken. So it can be a serpent or a toad? As far as I know, yeah. Which is crazy because when you think of a toad, it's not, you know, any kind of um, ferocious creature. That... I don't know if you've ever seen the eggs of a toad, uh, using the word eggs loosely. They're tiny and shellless. I know. <laughs> They're anamniotes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Now that you remind me, I'm starting to recall my days of elementary school science. Um, well, it's more likely going to be the egg of a serpent, but history states that it could be either. So I don't know. Um, take it up with Pliny the Elder, because he's the one who wrote quite a lot about them. He wrote quite a lot about everything, yeah. if I'm not mistaken. Right. But... Um... I think it might be more likely that a chicken would sit down on toad spawn than it would on a snake's egg. Probably, yeah, by accident, yeah. That's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking that this whole incubating another species' eggs is just by total mistake, by happenstance. I don't think they have the wherewithal to intentionally do it, knowing what's going to come of it. Because what happens after the mismatched incubation is with the basilisk a sort of chimera-like creature hatches. Mm. So there are different accounts of what the basilisk looks like. Like I mentioned earlier on Harry Potter would have you think that the basilisk is just going to be this humongous serpent with giant fangs and kind of slinks around and that that's something that's common with all basilisks they don't slither on the ground with their, with their tummies down they kind of slink with the top or the front half of their body held proud in the air hmm. so it's very menacing our couch is meowing oh my gosh forgive <laughs> <laughs> um yeah we might have a little cameo from the kittens later but um Sorry about that. So, the basilisk is only male, so they don't reproduce with each other. Interesting. I mean, I guess it makes sense. It's kind of like a mule. Yeah, exactly. It is, uh, someone call it an abomination. We uh, don't want to use such such words yeah. on our podcast where we're trying to befriend these fellas. It's more like a Reese's cup. You got my chicken and your toad. <laughs> oh, God. You got your toad and my chicken. <laughs> yeah. Oh, gosh. Let me try to fix that meowing catch real fast. Mm -hmm. So it's not really clear whether people in history saw a cockatrice and they just thought it was a basilisk. Or if they saw a basilisk and it had qualities of a, its cousin the cockatrice. It's hard to say. But... Really, the only way to know which is which for sure is by watching the incubation process. So I'm not really sure that it matters whether you're identifying a basilisk correctly because the way to kind of conquer or avoid them is the same. But anyway, with the basilisk, you're going to have most likely a humorously small snake boy. Uh, Pliny the Elder said that it was no more than 12 inches in length. Oh, wow. So, yeah. That's short. Yeah. Um, he also said that they were found in the Cyrene region of Libya. So they're mostly found in Africa today and parts of Western Europe. But hi, hair. Is he going to make an appearance? I think he might. What's more likely is that he's going to step on the keys and uh, ruin everything. Yep. Okay. There All he right. goes. So the basilisk likes to live in a hole, like most snakes do. And you can tell what is a basilisk home by the scorched grass and shrubs that are surrounding the area. 
Because the basilisk leaves death and destruction in its wake. Wow. Yeah, he has extremely toxic saliva that he will spit at its victims. I keep saying he. Well, I guess it, it is a only he. a he. It is only a he. So he's incredibly toxic. By many accounts, it is the most toxic creature in existence. So it is not hard to tell when he is making his presence known. Um, he is going to leave a trail of toxic slime that kills anything Sounds that it like touches. Basilisks and knuckleavies could uh, have some common ground. Yeah. Oh, man. It's a good thing they don't live right next to each other from what I have learned. Nuckleavies are in the northern region. Yeah, they're in the Orkney Islands. Yeah, so we don't have any danger of them getting together and having a, a death party. <laughs> Gosh, that'd be so scary. Death party. <laughs> Besides the toxicity, the basilisk can fly if it is gifted with wings. Um, mostly that's a cockatrice thing. But sometimes basilisks have dragon wings or bat-like wings. So some of them can fly. That's kind of neat. Yeah, it's neat, but also terrifying. I mean, it's a little 12-inch baby. Well, yeah. Actually, I'm going to post a picture of a, uh, not a cockatrice, a basilisk on the video. It's, oh my gosh, some of the pictures are adorable, but don't be fooled by it the cute appearance please be careful because not only does the basilisk have the toxic saliva it also can turn anything it looks at into stone so if you have seen or read harry potter in the chamber of secrets then that is something they got right i'm glad they got something right yeah so the basilisk has the stony glare like medusa Mm -hmm. And we'll probably do an episode on Medusa later on. Or at least Gorgons in general. Right. And he's got the the deadly spit. He also will contaminate anything that he drinks from, any body of water. So if you've got a well that a basilisk was hanging out in, then it's not good to drink from for centuries or longer before. Oh, it's potent. <laughs> yeah, before the poison is uh, diluted. Or just denatured. And try to avoid any rivers that had a basilisk sighting or a basilisk hole nearby. Because if it drinks from that river, then it's all tainted. And gosh, when that river goes into the ocean or a lake, then I don't even want to think about it. But it, it's it's no good. So just be very, very careful. And, you know... Carry around your uh, your life straw, your Brita filter. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> so you're probably trying to figure out, how am I going to get rid of this little basilisk guy that is poisoning all of our water supply? If you live in Egypt or Libya or Greece or other places that the basilisk has roamed to and settled in. Well, there are some major ways of avoiding it and exterminating the basilisk. The main thing is that it's terrified of weasels. Oh, like a regular snake. Yeah. This kind of harkens back to, you know, mongooses. Mongoose? Mongooses? I don't know. I honestly don't. <laughs> to mongooses loving to eat uh, Asiatic snakes. So... This is very similar to that. Um, yeah, it, it can't stand the weasel. If the weasel gets its scent on the basilisk's um, den or directly on the basilisk, then the basilisk might either slink away and find a new home or it might be killed uh, slowly. Oh, wow. But yeah, it's... Um, it is... Truly the basilisk's kryptonite. I can't imagine it would be too good for the weasel to touch the basilisk, though, if it's so... Right, yes. So if the weasel pees on the basilisk, then they're not getting direct contact. But the other thing that the weasel needs to worry about is that the basilisk also has extremely toxic breath. So if the basilisk breathes anywhere around the weasel, 
Um, I don't know if it has to be a direct like stream or just a, a cloud that's dissipated in the air, but that that is another thing that the weasel has to worry about. Um, it's a lot. It's a, a bum rap. <laughs> it's a lot to watch out for. Here's the thing. If you've got a basilisk in your village and you're trying to get rid of it, then historically people have thrown weasels into the den and the weasel will most likely kill the basilisk, but the weasel doesn't last long either. So it's definitely a sacrifice that the humans are yeah, that's not, forcing it into. Not quite humane. Yeah. But the weasel isn't completely defenseless. There is an herb called rue, R-U-E, that can withstand the basilisk's venom <laughs> somehow. It withstands the the destructive decay of the venom. And if the weasel finds a bush of rue, then it can pluck some in its little, in its little mouthy and kind of walk around and use it to ward off the basilisk. Well... The weasel itself does the better job of it, but it also helps to, the weasel to heal itself. So I think I think it just needs to eat it. I'm not sure that they have to kind of use it topically, rubbing it on their little weasel bodies, but um, that is definitely something that if you want to protect your local weasel population from basilisks, then plant some rue. That is a kind herb. <laughs> There is a related creature to the basilisk, um, its Icelandic cousin, the Skofin, which is killed either by gazing at another Skofin, it'll turn into stone, or if you shoot a silver button at it that's got a cross engraved in it. Very specific. But... Oh, they don't like buttons, just like Vajini. Oh yeah, I forgot! Oh my gosh, they are all related, they're part of the same... Cinematic universe. <laughs> so yeah, um, so we've got the Scofine, but by far the the closest cousin to the Basilisk is the Cockatrice. Let's get into mm -hmm. that. One thing I want to say, Scofine sounds like it would be a, a Basilisk if a Puffin incubated a toad or snake oh, egg. Oh no. Oh, I, I dare say that would be awfully cute. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. So, the cockatrice. The cockatrice has origins in mostly England, ancient England. Um, you don't hear about ancient England very much, but old England, that's what they say. Uh, it's also Roman, Greek, or Egyptian. Hey, Birdie, are you joining us? Hey, baby. We'll see. And the cockatrice's name comes from the Latin word calcare calcari calcari um, cal thank you which means to tread hey <laughs> birds mm -hmm. um and the cockatrice you know similarly to the basilisk it is another <laughs> mismatched incubation sort of situation um for you listeners birdies sniffing at the microphone and being his silly cute self hi bud do you want to learn about the cockatrice? <laughs> oh, goodness. You're getting fur in my tea. Oh, no. <laughs> so, I'm going to put this over here. I, oh, careful. <laughs> so, the cockatrice is a rooster egg, and you heard me right. Rooster, not hen. Huh. Magic. It's a rooster egg incubated by a toad or snake. I don't. I don't envy the rooster that has to go through the um, <laughs> the process of that. Yeah, they do have cloaca though, so it's a little uh, different. Yeah, I guess that's true. It's a true. little different. A I mean, little, but it's still, definitely not natural. <laughs> no. What can let we us, say? Let us not dwell on it. <laughs> yeah. So the cockatrice, as opposed to being mostly serpent-like, like its cousin, the basilisk. It is a two-legged sort of bird-snake combo wombo. Mm. It's got the head of a rooster, and most of the time it's got wings. So they could be 
dragon or rooster wings. That's fun. It's got a long, barbed, dragony tail, too. Okay. So just think uh, reptilian body rooster head. And the basilisk, I, I didn't mention this earlier, but they can range from... I mentioned they're, they're most of the time very tiny. Um, later sightings accounted that they were often giant, like in the Harry Potter universe, giant basilisks. Um, most of the time they were tiny, though. But the cockatrice is usually chicken sized. Oh. So another another mean little cutie. Oh, pickup size. <laughs> Snuggling size. Yeah. So <laughs> um there are male and female cockatrices. The males are differentiated like in chickens by their their wattles and their combs. Mm-hmm. And they can rarely be found um in the size of a, a dragon. So, Boom. big chicken. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I think that it just happens to be that the the ones that live a little longer might grow to dragon size. It's hard to say their lifespan, either the basilisk or, or the bird right. or the or cockatrice, the <laughs> but um, I know I'm all over the place. That's what happens when we do these these two Friends of Legend in one episode, so I apologize. But the cockatrice, um, I think, lives between 15 and 20 years. I don't know what the average lifespan is for a chicken. Do you happen to know that, Farmer Vince? No, believe it or not. <laughs> I haven't studied right. the life the lifespan of a chicken. <laughs> I'm thinking somewhere in the fives, if I had to guess. Yeah, that sounds about right. Write us in. We don't know any. We're, we're urban babies. Please Send us without context the lifespan of a chicken. <laughs> Just the number. Yeah. So, anyway. So, usually the cockatrice is chicken-sized and very chickeny in appearance. They're mostly males, you know, whereas with the common chicken, it's, you know, vastly female to male. And with cockatrices, you've got very protective males. So the hens, the cockatrice hens, can lay cockatrice eggs and the nest will be fiercely protected by the cockatrice male. So they can reproduce. They are, uh, what is the word? Valid? What is the word? Oh, fertile? Yeah, well, yeah. Oh, I thought there was a cooler word, but um, sorry. It's okay. They're not like mules. They're so not like basilisks. Yeah, the opposite of sterile would be fertile. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. I thought there was a... I'm always trying to use old English words. And it never quite works out. Yes, that's it. Okay. So, you've got these adorable little chicken snake babies. They, too, have the power to petrify any victim with its gaze. Now, it is widely held that cockatrices are immune to other cockatrice gazes for the most part um that is a little a little hazy because if you hold a mirror up to it then many people say that it can turn itself to stone oh, um so it can't get high off its own supply <laughs> or yeah. it can get high off its own supply right yeah so the cockatrice is also extremely extremely toxic what it has that the basilisk doesn't have is all those rooster feathers. So Ooh. what it tends to do is it coats its down with venom. And anything that touches it or inhales its toxic gas like the basilisk mm -hmm. uh, is pretty much done for. Oh, beans. So, yeah, it's, it's a very dangerous little guy. <laughs> uh, some say that the cockatrice has fire-breathing capabilities. I've seen a lot of depictions of that. Yeah. Not the least of which being uh, Good Mythical Morning. Yeah, I was going to mention that a little later, but I'll mention it now. Oops. Um, one of one of my favorite YouTube channels, Good Mythical Morning. Their their kind of mascot is the cockatrice, and they use it in their theme song, and it breathes fire, and it's really cute. Um, I wonder what it has to do with the show itself. Well, it's mythical. Of course, we know that these creatures aren't you know 
just pure myth because they are they are rooted in the real world and the only reason that people think that they're mythological is because they have been you know unlucky to not see them so in this case i don't think we're going to be going hunting for the cockatrice or the basilisk but you know friends of legend is all about dispelling beliefs that these creatures are irredeemable and fake you know they're they're most always neither meow would you agree yes i would i'm sorry i paused <laughs> it's okay so the cockatrice is by no means elusive or solitary it can live in dens of up to 12 cockatrices. Hmm. So just know that a flock of them, I don't know what it's called um, scientifically. A flockatrice. <laughs> if you have a flockatrice on your hands, it is almost impossible to escape. So just be aware that they do like to kind of travel together, or at least live together. Do. But they... Um, they are Roman little, little chickens. They... <laughs> Like I like I mentioned earlier, the name comes from the Latin word to tread, or the old French word to track, and that is most likely because they are known to track down and kill crocodiles in the Nile. Huh. Um, so, yeah, they um, they're very they're very predatory. They're hunters. I guess. Wow. Yeah. Can you imagine being a crocodile just cavorting? in a in a river seeing a chicken thinking <laughs> what nice you gonna snack. do <laughs> what you gonna do chicken and then all of a sudden your belly up oh my gosh i cannot imagine i cannot imagine so they they like to prey upon poor little crocodiles for some strange reason but their main diet is similar to chickens they live on seeds and insects and small animals like rodents if they're not eating people hmm. so you know how i mentioned that they have a petrifying gaze well what happens when you look directly into the eye of a cockatrice is you start turning into stone from the outside in so um graphic warning what happens is the cockatrice or a group of cockatrices will a cockatrice. Uh, yes i'm only gonna I'm only going to reference them like that from now on because it's so good. If you have a flockatrice that has gazed into your eyes and has turned your skin to stone, you don't have long before it decides to start pecking into your skin and eating the soft tissue that still remains. Mm. So they can eat humans, yes. It doesn't seem to be their main source of nourishment, but I think they just like to mess with all manner of creature because they seem to be doing it for fun sometimes. Yeah. Uh, like tracking down crocodiles. It doesn't seem like a very sustainable thing for them, for their kind. But I feel like they just, they get kicks from it, you know? So, you can overcome the petrification if you kind of let it wear off if the cockatrice decides for some reason that it's not hungry and it doesn't want to peck into your skin and eat you from the inside out then it is it is sometimes said that your petrification will go away with time huh um it can take up to a few days but gosh i don't know you know i hope that you have someone taking care of you in the meantime maybe okay maybe it's the case where you look into a cockatrice's eyes and you're with a buddy and your buddy's wearing sunglasses or is blind or something to that effect and they're safe maybe they can take your stony body back home and put a mirror in front of the cockatrice to kind of distract it yeah and then you're safe somewhat safe Whew, that's a lot of a lot of posturing to to get there it is yes yeah 
So besides the weakness that basilisks and cockatrices share for weasels, they also cannot stand the crow of a rooster, a cock. Um, many say that it kills them immediately, if Ooh. not just drive them away from their den. So, so some people, if they're going willingly into cockatrice territory, they will bring with them a rooster. <laughs> Well, I guess it's good for the cockatrices that they're incubated by a toad and not by their dear old dad mom. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, the other thing that you can bring along with you are, if you have them, phoenix tears. Usually what people will do when they're trying to ward off a cockatrice is they'll just throw these things, these weaknesses, into the den. Um, as opposed to using them in battle, because most likely by the time you're in battle and it is aware of you, it's too late. Yeah. So most stories are about folks throwing things into the den. So you can throw in a weasel, a poor little weasel. You can throw in some phoenix tears. You know, be careful where you aim them, because that is not a uh, an easy commodity to come by, I'm sure. No. You know, we learned that a few episodes ago. Right, yes. Or you can toss in a rooster if you want to be, you know, a meanie. That's not really very humane. Um, but probably the most sustainable option is to just hang on to a rooster. And I don't, like I said, we're very urban and I don't know how often they crow if not at sunrise. Wonder if a recording would work. Yeah, oh. Yeah, they might not know the difference. That actually takes me to my next point. Cockatrices are not very bright. Hmm. So, it, it has been done where a human has made some form of relationship with them. I don't want to say friendship because it was a little bit parasitic. But there's a story that I read of one human who gained the cockatrice's trust somehow. I don't know the details, but they they did not anger the cockatrice, so the cockatrice didn't emit its toxic spray. And I guess they avoided its gaze long enough that the cockatrice just decided to kind of buddy up to it. So the human then took the cockatrice around to its human victims and held the cockatrice out oh. and the people had no choice but to look into its little cute eyes and they were temporarily petrified. So the human then took the valuable belongings of its victims and stowed them away for trophies. But that didn't last very long because those humans were only temporarily petrified. You know, the cockatrice was more or less his pet, so he didn't let it linger and peck the human's flesh. He presumably just showed Damn. it to the people and took it away and did that with everyone in the town. And so these people were not eaten, and they later came back to life more or less and they found the guy out and they killed him and uh, they took their stuff back well all's well that ends well yeah so that was the only instance of a relationship with humans that i found of either a basilisk or a cockatrice i didn't see any about the basilisk I don't mean to alert you, but I think there's another friend of legend in the uh, in the view screen. Oh, yeah, that's Harry. That is Harry. So you've got various methods of avoiding and or destroying the cockatrice. You've got the weasel, you've got the rooster crow, and the phoenix tears. Another thing that you can do before the cockatrice is even hatched is if you have a suspicious looking egg or an egg that you know your chicken or rooster laid and you saw a snake or a toad sitting on it and you're like i'm not gonna take my chances what you can do is you can throw the egg over your house 
And if it doesn't hit the house, any part of it, the roof, anything, and it lands on the other side, it doesn't have to stay intact, but that <laughs> is the best way of destroying it. I'm guessing if you hit the house with the egg, then it is still enchanted and viable. Um, so that is going to be your best bet of avoiding it hatching. Well. Yeah, so... Um, Preferably a single story, maybe a little hut or a cottage, something you can easily toss the egg over. I mean, could you just toss it over the chicken coop? Would that count? I don't know. You can try, I guess. I don't know what would happen if it if it lands. Maybe it doesn't crack. Anyway, I don't want to find out. There are so many different parts to it that there's a lot of ambiguity you know yeah and i just i don't want to find any of it out anyway if you have a druid or a ranger friend like we all ought to then they are pretty dang good at warding off cockatrices as well because they can summon roosters and weasels summon woodland creatures yeah yeah so make sure that if you ever go to england or egypt or what was it, Libya, where the basilisk lives, mm -hmm. that you look into finding the local druid or ranger because they're probably going to help you out quite a bit. I think a weasel or a chicken would be like a CR one quarter creature, so you could probably get up to 12 of them. I think that's how that works. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> but take advantage of that. So like I mentioned... We really can't easily become friends with a cockatrice or a basilisk. You can either enlist the help of one of those animals that I mentioned, or you can carry around a mirror with you. I don't know if I mentioned, but if you put a mirror in front of a cockatrice or a basilisk, like if you lower it into its den on some rope or something, then most likely it's either going to attack its reflection because like a cat yeah even though they can live with each other they always attack each other so <laughs> they're not very amiable it'll either attack its reflection or it will turn itself into stone with its gaze it's hard to say which ones are immune to the to the gaze and which ones aren't but mm. that is also amb ambiguous but you can just carry around a mirror that's probably going to be your easiest method of avoiding it or, you know, hurting it. Mm -hmm. So, as much as I hate to say, um, it's not going to be an easy task to become friends with one of these fellas. But maybe as history continues, you know, I'm always kind of hoping that some of these beasties will evolve and maybe become a little more domesticated. That's probably a very selfish thing to say, but... Yeah, and that kind of thing doesn't happen by accident either. <sighs> it's true, it's true. We're going to have to work on it. We're going to have to probably have a lot of patience. Yep. Yeah. And a lot of weasel pee. Oh, God. Ah! I'd rather carry around Phoenix Tears. Well, let's be real. Which one are you more likely to get? I know. I know. Okay. Now I want to talk a little bit about the modern references to these two fellas. The Basilisk is most prominently featured in Harry Potter. There's also a lizard named the Basilisk Lizard, or Basiliscus, mm -hmm. and that is encompassing a few different kinds of specific lizards. One of the most notable that is a Basiliscus is the Jesus Christ Lizard, yep. the one that runs on water. Yeah, it's got big old floppy feet that yeah. it can use to uh, disperse its surface tension on the water. Yeah, those are so much fun to watch videos mm -hmm. of. It's not related to the basilisk exactly. It's just the same name. Mm. Um, as we talked about before, basilisk means um, serpent or serpent king. So not related, not cousins as far as we know. And they're not poisonous or venomous as far as I know. Right, either. yeah, as far as I know. As far as the cockatrice, it's a bit more common in pop culture today. There is an SCP that I don't know if you've heard that one, but SCP-1013 is a cockatrice. Nope, hadn't heard about that one. That's yeah, fine. 
So the specifics on that one, it's got a 54 meter stare. Very specific. Goo. And it temporarily paralyzes its victims. The full petrification occurs around 8 to 10 minutes after it stares at you. But if the subject is bitten when it's paralyzed, then calcification occurs from the outside in, and the cockatrice, cockatrice will eat its subject like, you know, like regular cockatrices do. So that all sounds pretty historically accurate. I mentioned that it's the logo for GMM. It's also a, a monster in Dungeons & Dragons. I don't know if you've seen that entry in the Monster Handbook. I'm aware of it. I've never used one or combated one in a game. From what I could tell, it's just a cute little chicken-sized monster. It, it's not very strong or intelligent. It has the petrifying gaze. You need to throw a constitution saving throw in order to not be affected by the the stone turning. Um, if you fail your second save, then you're petrified for 24 hours. Uh, I sh probably shouldn't be giving you any ideas for your next D&D &D session, either you or Aaron. <laughs> Y'all are in enough trouble as it is. <laughs> I know, it's true. It is also a featured monster in Witcher 3, the video game, not the show. And that one is quite a bit more dragon-sized of a cockatrice. Goo. It's got its poisonous spray, and it flies above you while it attacks. So very, very menacing. I'm not really sure the, the method that the Witcher likes to, that Geralt likes to kill the cockatrice, but... Probably has some kind of um, potion or poultice that oh. protects him from the poison. Mm -hmm. He's good about that stuff. There's also a Minecraft mod. I think it's a mod. I don't think it's part of the main game. That is a cute little cockatrice. Very, very silly looking. I love those little 8 bit fellas. Mm. And uh, last but not least, it is featured in a lot of old literature. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of something called the Bible, mm. but there are many mentions of the cockatrice in the Bible. Oh, you mean the Bibli? Yes, the Bibli. Okay. Yes, I gotcha. the Biblioteca. There is especially a lot of mention in the um, one of the 14th century translations of the Bible of the cockatrice, and later in history, it was just translated into um, the more general serpent. So, so there's that. Shakespeare also liked to mention the cockatrice a few times. Mm. It's mentioned in Richard III and Romeo and Juliet. Just people comparing other folks, other characters to a cockatrice with uh, deadly glare, which is quite an insult. Um, sounds better when Shakespeare is saying it. It's also a prominent figure in English heraldry. So you'll see a lot of, oh, there's Harry. Mm-hmm. You'll see a lot of, oh, there's Terry. You'll see a lot of sigils for family houses with the cockatrice or a basilisk. It's pretty cool looking. I mean, it definitely makes for good artwork, mm -hmm. especially it's it's got that long winding tail and it, it looks really neat on a family shield. Speaking of heraldry, there is a Game of Thrones house that's got the basilisk or the cockatrice on its sigil. Do you know which one? Uh, well, I looked at the sheet, but ah! I was already aware of it. I'm pretty sure it's a Dornish house. It, where's the salt shore? I'm, well, I mean, there's a bunch of different areas that have the word salt in them. I don't remember. I'm pretty sure it's Dornish, though. Okay, we'll have to look into that later. But House Gargolin. 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 Yeah, Gargolin. Um, anyway, this is not super important, but they have the cockatrice on their sigil. There's also the Basilisk Isles, which are southeast of Westeros and, of course, are home to basilisks. How did I miss that? How did oh. I miss that? <laughs> There's so much information on the internet, and if I talked about all of it, we'd be going on for days. I don't think you have that kind of time, dear viewer, listener. So. Friend time. Definitely, definitely a hard friend to make. Now... This is the part of the show where we like to give our friend rating based on how easy it is to become friends with them. 
you've never listened or watched, we've got four tiers. None of them have watched. No one's now. watched. I know. This is so exciting. So the first tier of our friend rating is friend shaped. Think of a friend that would present you with a beautiful bouquet of flowers for your birthday. Like a gnome, my best example, my favorite example at least. Then next up you have cheeky friend, the kind of friend who would present the, the kind of friend who would present you with a bouquet of flowers, but one of the ones in the middle is one of those squirt flowers. Uh, think of something like the Caso Abake. Next up we have spicy friend. This friend is going to give you a bouquet of flowers that it knows is the kind of flower you're allergic to. And maybe there are some stray bees in the bouquet as well, and the, and they're aware. <laughs> Think of something like the Nikur. Then lastly, we have not a friend yet. This is going to be the kind of friend, uh, friend, that leaves flowers on your front porch to draw you out so that they can get the drop on you. <sighs> Terrible. So, knowing everything you know about the basilisk and the cockatrice, what would you rate them? Not a friend yet, except for that one guy who had the, the cockatrice that he took blame of. Yeah, it was more of a pet and, like I said, a parasitic relationship. Not healthy at all. I guess it depends on who you ask and different people's definition of friendship, but uh, I wouldn't call that true friendship. No. I would say not a friend yet as well. And I'm trying to, I'm trying to rack my brain for... Any any little loophole that would get us on their good side or, you know, them on our good side. You come prepared for the best but expecting the worst. You maybe bring some food that they would like um, with you, but you also have a vial of weasel pee and um, mirrored sunglasses. Yeah. And... I don't know, maybe like a gas mask. You should mm -hmm. be wearing a mask anyway right now. <laughs> yes, exactly. But yeah, that's what I would think. Just come decked out for prevention, but also the potential of exposing yourself to them. Yes. And getting them comfortable with your presence. I think that's good advice, sound advice. I'm I'm not in any huge hurry to meet one in real life. I like to just kind of look at them from afar because they are so funny looking and cute. More than 54 meters. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you you know what you can do to protect yourself. Use this information. Don't go hunting them necessarily if they are not terrorizing villages specifically. Just. Keep your snakes and your toads and your chickens separate. Yes. Yeah. That that was some advice that I, w I was going to tell everyone. Make sure you keep a very close eye on your coop and your flocks and that you set up protective barriers around your farm. Y'all, I know, I know that it must be hard on, you know, farm life to... Keep an eye on every single creature you have, but if, if you got to focus on <laughs> one set in particular, I guess the chickens. Yeah, yeah, that's nothing new. Thank you for listening and perhaps watching our episode. This was um, a little a little weird to try out. I hope it came off better than I expected it to. <laughs> Hopefully y'all at least had some fun. I hope so. I hope you learned something. So Halloween is coming up, as y'all know, and we are taking suggestions. We're always taking suggestions, but specifically we want your suggestions for Halloween-like creatures. So if you have a creature that you see in one of your favorite scary movies and you want to learn a little bit more about it, then write into us at friendsoflegend.com. We have a contact form there. Or you can email us directly at friendsoflegend at gmail.com. I'll probably make a Facebook post and you'll probably make a tweet about it as well. But we're going to do two or three Halloween themed episodes. Yes, we are. We're very excited for it. It's true. Also, if you liked what you heard and watched, make sure to subscribe and rate us. It helps so much and it makes us aware that you, you like what we're doing. You can always... 
review us and tell us what you like specifically. If you want to subscribe to our YouTube channel, that'll show us that you like the video and we'll continue to do these. Probably not every week. Um, we got all the audio recordings up on YouTube as well. Obviously yes. no video. And then of course the Neep Times. Yeah, yeah. Our little friend Neep is, is uh, well, mostly vacationing in his little gnome home. So he's not very active on YouTube, but he's got a few videos up. But yeah, I really, I really want to know what y'all thought of these videos, and I hope you enjoy them and let us know either way. Yes, please. Yeah. In addition to um, getting into the various content areas, we have our website as well, where you can find all episodes, frequently asked questions, transcripts of the episodes themselves, and also a contact form to contact us directly if you wish. Yep. And new episodes are up every Saturday, so make sure that you do subscribe to us. We're all over the place. If you're watching us on YouTube, then just know that we are on all the major podcast players. So just look up Friends of Legend and find us out and you'll be updated whenever we post new episodes if you subscribe to us. Yep, I put a little hint on Twitter every Friday about the episode that'll come out the next day. It's a lot of fun. So thank you again for listening and watching. And remember, when it comes to Friends of Legend, charm them. Do not harm them. There's a cat in the couch. I sure can.